as you sit under the ministry of his word this morning. Uh, last week, we continued our study of being alienated from the world and what a privilege it is for us as Christians to be alienated from the world. But we, we really concentrated on the fact that uh, when you hear that, even as a Christian, um, that, that kind of makes me cringe a little bit because my flesh loves the world. And we went through Romans chapter 7 last week. I promised you that uh, this outline, this updated outline, and I'm not smart enough to uh, have all of this figured out uh, 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 beforehand. So as I go through this outline, I update it and, and see the way that the Lord leads. And so uh, in your printout, if you have a printout in front of you, uh, as I promised, and I don't always fulfill with my promises, but uh, I did uh, get you this updated uh, uh, part of the outline, the number one, two, and three, in the Father's affection. And so if you don't mind, again, I'll just highlight for you as we begin, turn back to 1 John chapter 3. I noticed in the video that I said 1 John chapter 1 last week, so um, I know it's a surprise to you that I make mistakes, but uh, 1 John chapter 3 First John chapter 3, we took quite a few weeks to consider verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And then I told you that it took me quite a while to grasp this next part of the verse, where it says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. I didn't understand why the Lord would mention that at that time uh, and in this portion of Scripture. And I came to understand uh, that uh, he was then going to tell us some of the honors, some of the privileges uh, of being a child of God. And so in verses 1 through 3, we have three uh, honors, if you will, three privileges of being a child of God. The first one is what we're concentrating on again this morning, being alienated from the world. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. In verse 2, now, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Number two, and I'm anxiously looking forward to this topic of being transformed. Being transformed. One of the great privileges of being a child of God is the anticipation of being transformed. And then lastly, in verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in himself, purif in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. The ability to be pure, or sanctification, and looking forward to that as well, but uh, uh, just in anticipation of next couple of weeks, I'm, I'm very excited about thinking about uh, uh, being transformed, being raptured, the, the resurrection, all of the things that are involved. As far as I know, this is our last study on being alienated from the world. So we are going to consider now, again, being alienated from the world. You might remember that uh, on one of our printouts that we had last week, I, I asked you to uh, ignore a, uh, a part of the printout because I changed my message after uh, we went, or I got the printout uh, printed out by Dan. And uh, so we are going to look at the, an illustration in Scripture this morning of three men, and they all are intertwined in the Old Testament. And uh, so I hope it will be a, a blessed study for you. We're going to look at the awful. We're going to look at the alienated, and then we're going to look at the ambivalent. And remember that uh, the ambivalent is the, uh, an uncertainty or an indecisiveness as to which course to follow. And unfortunately, um, I, I, I'm very ashamed to say that there are times in my life more than 
I probably even realized, but there are times in my life when there is an uncertainty, there is a uh, indecisiveness into which course to follow. Do I love the world or do I love Christ? And uh, it's that black and white in And yet, our flesh loves to make things gray. He, that, that's what our flesh, that's what Satan is a professional at. He wants to make things middle of the ground gray. And the scriptures don't do that. It's love the world or love Christ. That, that's all there is. There's only two options. And so I, I told you that I've had Jehoshaphat on my heart for, for two or three weeks. I've tried to give you him as an illustration for two or three weeks and it, it, it just didn't fit the message and it and and so uh, thankfully I am excited to consider King Jehoshaphat this morning but before we get to King Jehoshaphat we want to look at two other men who are prevalent in the same portions of scripture as King Jehoshaphat so we're going to start with the awful we're going to start with King Ahab so if you don't mind, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. We're going to consider exactly how bad this king, and I want to make sure that you understand that he is a king of Israel. He's not the king of Samaria. He's not the king of Germany. He's not the king of Russia or China. He's not the Philistine king. He is the king of Israel. Israel, God's chosen people. Now, by this time in the history of Israel, the kingdom has been rent in two by God. And there are the ten northern tribes and there are the two southern tribes. Now, Ahab is the king of Israel the ten northern tribes. And let's just find out a little bit about this man. It says in verse 28, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 28, So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son reigned in his stead. And in thirty and eight years of Asa king of Judah begat Ahab the son of Omri to reign in Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned in Israel, in Samaria, 22 years. One of the things that always fascinates me is how God, how much God allows these men to reign in Israel. It is, why doesn't God just, I mean, he obviously knows who this man is and what he's going to be like. Why doesn't he just eliminate him right away? Why, why did he not even allow him to be born? And yet we, God is in complete control. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if, had, as if it had been a life. Thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zyodians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And in his days did Hael the Bethlehemite build Jericho. He laid the foundations thereof in Abram his firstborn. Now, I'm just going to mention this. I do not know if this is true or not, but some believe that this was the fact that he actually sacrificed his son. Now, I, uh, there's more than one commentator who actually believes that at the beginning of this building, he actually laid the body of his son. And I wouldn't be surprised, but I can't give you that as a direct truth. But I can at least ask you to consider that many commentators consider Verse 34, as uh, 
the sacrificing of children. Uh, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, Se according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Uh, so I just want you to consider how bad of a king King Ahab was. Now, obviously, I'm doing this for a reason. Um, I don't want you to just walk out of here saying, boy, Ahab was a really bad king. Um, no, there's, there's more to it than that, and we'll get to that as we go through this message, okay? Um, you'll remember that in 1 Kings chapter 18, and if you don't mind turning there, please, 1 Kings chapter 18, it was Ahab who was against Elijah, the prophet of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 18, and we won't spend too much time in chapter 18. You'll remember that Elijah prayed down fire from heaven and consumed the altar with the water and then he slayed the prophets of Baal and uh, you'll remember that wonderful story in 1 Kings chapter 18. If you don't, boy, it would be a blessing I know to you uh, to consider how Elijah stood up against this very, very wicked man. A king of Israel, by the way. Uh, let's just look at verse 13. First um, Kings chapter 18, uh, one of the thoughts I wanted to give you, was it not told my Lord what I did when Je Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? Remember that uh, Ahab is married to Jezebel, and now you're seeing that Ahab is um, involved in the slain of God's prophets. I, I wanted you to know that about how bad this guy is. And now look at verse 17. When they finally meet in person, when Ahab and Elijah finally meet in person, and it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, remember that uh, Elijah came and pronounced that there was going to be a drought for numerous years. I think it was three to three and a half years. And Ahab tried to find Elijah all through that time and couldn't find him because God had hit him. And then God finally says, okay, I want you to confront this man. And this confrontation is a very famous confrontation with the fire coming down and quenching the altar. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Oh, here's the guy that's been a problem to Israel. Uh, and then, of course, Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and have followed, and, ha and thou hast followed Balaam. Okay, um, another wicked act that's recorded for us in Scripture is Naboth's vineyard. You remember that Ahab was uh, standing around in his uh, palace one day and he looked over someone else's vineyard, Naboth's vineyard. And he said, boy, I'd love to have that vineyard. And Jezebel says, you're the king, just take it. Just take it. And so if you don't mind, turn over to chapter 21. And we're just going to read a couple verses here. How you remember that there was a great injustice done to Naboth. And Naboth is blackmailed, if you will, falsely so. Blasphemed. Uh, let's, uh, and of course this is all Jezebel's doing. Ahab wasn't uh, smart enough or strong enough to uh, uh, think about doing something as wicked as this. But uh, he as is noted... Uh, because he was the husband of the woman who came up with all this. Uh, verse 13, And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him, and the men of Belial witnessed against him, witnessed against, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Now we, we know that that didn't happen, that Naboth was a godly man. Uh, remember, and uh, it's been some time since I, we've considered this wonderful portion of Scripture. But when the king came to Naboth and said, Hey, I want to buy your vineyard. Naboth said, No way. And you remember that the vineyard was part of his birthright. Uh, it would have been very sinful for Naboth to uh, pay or, or profit in that way 
for, from selling his vineyard to Ahab. And so it, it goes much deeper than just a, uh, a little bit of a financial gain for Naboth. It, it would have been essentially him forsaking his birthright. And uh, Naboth, being a godly man, says no way. And so, of course, there's no way that Naboth blasphemed God and king. And they cried him, they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then sent, they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And you'll remember that Jezebel goes in and says, Hey, you wanted that vineyard? Here it is. It's yours. And Ahab's like, Oh, wonderful. Thank you, honey. You know, what, what a nice anniversary present to, to give me. I, I, this, I, I'm doing all this. I'm, I'm reminding you of really and truly how bad this guy really is. Okay? Now, in chapter 21, I want you to start, and we're going to look now at his death. 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 17. Um, it, it, it is uh, amazing to me that God allowed um, First Kings, oh okay, First Kings chapter uh, 21, and let's start in verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he has gone down to possess it. And thus shalt thou speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou, hast, and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus shalt Thus saith the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick the blood, even thine. Uh, it was a very horrific condemnation to a Jewish man, especially a king, that he would not have a very reverenced funeral. And they, they didn't do anything with Naboth's body when he was stoned. And the Lord says, you are going to experience the same that Naboth did. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to the work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy prosperity and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat and like the house of Basha the son of Ahijah for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin and of Jezebel also spake the Lord saying the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the fields, in the fields shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Uh, this was a very, very wicked man. And uh, I, I wasn't planning on reading these next few verses, but uh, let's read them. I, I want you to see, well, let's, let's just read the next couple of verses, okay? And it came to pass when Ahab heard the wor those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. Okay, so I'm just going to simply ask you, what would you do? If you were a person who was able to forgive in this situation, what would be your reaction to Ahab? I'm going to tell you what my reaction would have been. Uh, no way, buddy. You made your bed, now sleep in it. 
But that's the difference between me and God. Because I want you to hear what God, how God reacts to this very wicked man. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Now, Ahab died the same way that he, God told him he would die. And the dogs did lick the blood of Ahab. And Ahab did not receive the honorable funeral that he should have as being a king of Israel or a king of Judah. But a lot of the wickedness or the lot of the judgment that God pronounced upon his uh, reign, God was merciful. God is a merciful God. Now let me, let me just ask you, what's your reaction to this? No way, God. No way you should have done this. I mean, look at this guy. Look how bad he is. I, wait a minute. Let's consider the fact. That that shouldn't be our reaction at all. Our reaction should be, I can't believe you're so merciful to me. I believe that that's a more spiritual reaction. To look at someone like Ahab and say, man, God, he didn't deserve that. I don't know how you did that. Is uh, not a very spiritual reaction. Realizing that God is just as merciful to us and to me as he is to Ahab. Okay, uh, so we looked at the awful. And Ahab is most definitely awful. And I am again going to ask you to forgive me that I am really hot here. Okay. So now let's look at the alienated. Let's look at Micaiah. You know that he's one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. So you want to grow up and serve the Lord, huh? You want to grow up and do what the Lord wants you to do. Well, you might want to consider reading this portion of Scripture as a man who served the Lord and was alienated from Israel, alienated from um, really his life. Um, so as we come to this portion of Scripture, Jehoshaphat, who we will look at in just a few moments, and Ahab are now joined together and they're wanting to fight a battle okay and uh, so we're gonna start in verse 4 uh, I have a little uh, little summary of Micaiah's life a very small summary of Micaiah's life from uh, the Smith Bible Dictionary who is like God Micaiah the son of Imla was a prophet of Samaria who is the last last year of the reign of Ahab king of Israel predicted his defeat and death okay so as we come into this story Ahab and Jehoshaphat have decided to fight a battle and uh, we'll pick up the story in verse 4 so 2nd Chronicles chapter 18 and we're going to pick up the story in verse 4. Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, that would be Ahab, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together the prophets four hundred men and said unto them, Shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they, the four hundred prophets, said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. You are going to win this battle. Four hundred prophets said, You got the thumbs up from God. Okay? But Jehoshaphat said, That's who we're going to look at in just a few moments. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not yet here a prophet of the Lord besides? 
So we see some, je- some discernment in Jehoshaphat's life. He said, you know, I've got to be honest with you, Ahab. Uh, these 400 men, they, they, you pay them. Why are they going to say anything but what you want them to say? Is there a prophet of the Lord that we could hear of? That we may inquire of him. And the king of Israel, verse 7, said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man. (laughs) One man. I want you to catch that. One man. You talk about being alienated from the world. Listen, it's it's not an easy thing to stand alone. It's not an easy thing. But thank God there have been men like Micaiah down through the ages. So the percentage, if we were to put the percentage up on the screen on CNN and we were going with the popular opinion here, it would be 400 against one. There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Ahab says, I hate this guy. Why? For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. Do you want to know why? It's because Ahab was evil. That's why. The same is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, oh, don't let the king, don't don't say that. The king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne clothed in robes. And they sat in a void place. Very important to understand that when you compromise, you move away from God and you go into a void place. And that's what Jehoshaphat is doing. At the entering into the gates of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah the son of Chenanah made um, horns of iron. And boy, you talk about just uh, uh, the pomp and circumstance. And it's go up, you're going to win, you're going to win. Look at verse 12. And the messengers that went to call Micaiah spake unto him. What a testimony this man has. Because even the messengers know. Behold, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one assent. Let thy words, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. Can you imagine? Hey, 400 prophets just said that they should join together and that they are going to win this battle. Make sure that your message is the same as them. Verse 13, thank the God. Thank Thank the Lord for Micaiah. He says, as the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. Not what's popular. Not what everyone else is doing or saying. But I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. But if you do that, my friend, beloved, you are more than likely going to be alienated from this world. Verse 14, And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hands. Now he must have said this in such a way that it was very sarcastic. And the king, because of verse 15, the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? And so now Micaiah is going to tell him exactly what he sees. Micaiah had received a vision in verse 16. I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the reason was is because they were a sheep with no shepherd. Oh, they had a king, but he was no godly king. And the Lord said, They have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. And so 400 prophets, the popular opinion is, Go and fight. You're going to win. But God's opinion is, Go back. You're going to lose. Verse 17, And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee, that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil. Did Micaiah prophesy evil? No. He prophesied 
truth. And what did that get him? Well, it got him in more trouble. We're going to uh, skip down uh, to verse 25. Micaiah essentially gives this uh, very interesting story. We won't take the time to read it, but Micaiah essentially gives this story of that uh, God the Father says, is there a lying prophet here that would uh, uh, deceive Ahab for me? And a lying prophet, a demon, in my opinion, raises his hand and says, I I'll lie. He says, okay, you go and you speak in the name of the 400 prophets and uh, the two kings will follow you and Ahab will die in battle. So that's, that's essentially what the verses say. Uh, skip down to verse uh, 25. I, I want you to hear the, you know, the good ending. You ready? Then the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said, Take ye Micaiah, and carry him back to Imlon, the governor of the city, to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in prison, and feed him with the bread of affliction, and with the water of affliction, until I return in peace. Well, guess what? Ahab does not return in peace. He dies in battle. Okay, Pastor, well, um, let's, let's turn to the portion of Scripture where Micaiah gets out of prison. There isn't one. As far as I can tell, and uh, looking at a number of commentators, um, I am pretty confident that there is no other mention of Micaiah in Scripture. As far as I can tell, Micaiah died in prison, eating the bread of affliction and the water of affliction. So you want to serve the Lord? If you want to serve the Lord, before you do, before you say yes, consider that there is going to be an alienation from the world. That the world hates, as we have highlighted in past messages, the world hates God. It hates God. And it hates everything godly. And if you are going to be godly, you are going to be alienated from the world. Which leads us to Jehoshaphat. And this is really where my burden lies this morning. Jehoshaphat, the ambivalent, the word ambivalence, again, uh, I have the definition up on the screen for you. Uncertainty or indecisiveness as to which course to follow. Now you won't have this because I just added this last night. You won't have this in your printout. James chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? And the answer, unfortunately, to that so much of the time is yes. Yes, out of my same mouth can come blessings and cursings. Out of the fountain of my life can become sweet water and bitter. Oh, pa Pastor, you curse God? Well, I don't necessarily know that I have ever shook my fist at God and said, I curse you, God. I, I haven't went that far. But in my actions, I'm ashamed to say. Out of the same mouth, blessings and cursings. Ambivalence in a Christian's life. Not knowing which course to follow. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And unfortunately, we're going to come to a man now by the name of Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. And I told you that he has been on my heart for three or four weeks now, maybe two or three weeks here. The, his name means the Lord is judge. And if you were 
um, to study the life of Jehoshaphat and to consider the life of Jehoshaphat. If I had to ask you right now, and I won't, because I don't remember, I don't know the last time that you may have studied him, but I've studied him pretty in depth for the last couple of weeks. If I was to tell you, or I guess maybe if you were to ask me, and I was to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down in the life of Jehoshaphat, I would give you a thumbs up. He was a godly man. But he wasn't as godly as he could have been. And, and that's where my heart lies here this morning. He wasn't like Micaiah. Here Jehoshaphat is standing there listening to the truth of God's word. And Jehoshaphat watched Micaiah leave and be sent back to prison and to live in affliction for the rest of his days, where, where, was, where was that in Jehoshaphat's life? Unfortunately, so many of us, and I'm including myself in this, were more like Jehoshaphat than we are like Micaiah. We're not going to say something because, you know what, we, we may get fired. We may have to you know, really actually suffer for, for, for our faith. No one, none, we don't want to take that. That's, that's too much. So let's consider Jehoshaphat in ambivalence. And I, again, I think that I forgot to change the printout. So um, the highlight at the top, the, the number Roman numeral 3, Maybe from last week, I apologize. Just want to read this very quickly. This should be in your printout. He was a good and a godly king, but he got involved in three costly compromises. The first one we really heard about, compromise number one, is uh, when he married his son to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, we essentially read much about that in 1st Chronicles chapter 18. Um, Jehoshaphat thought, you know what, if my daughter would marry Ahab's son, I could really get, to, you know, power, money. I, I don't know what his thought process was, but uh, he should not in any way, shape, or form have tried to arrange a marriage with um, Ahab's son. The compromise number two, when Jehoshaphat got entangled with the affairs of his son's father-in-law Ahab, when Syria attacked Israel, Ahab's evil influence uh, affected the reign of Jehoshaphat's grandson Isaiah, and this compromise almost cost Jehoshaphat his life. That was the second compromise. And the third, when Joshua, Jehoshaphat and we won't, we won't read any of this. This is something you could read on your own. When Jehoshaphat foolishly joined forces with Ahab's son, Ahiah, and tried to get rich by importing foreign goods, the Lord uh, wrecked his fleet and rebuked him for his sinful alliance. Uh, so now I just want to read a few portions of scripture uh, with and about Jehoshaphat, okay? Uh, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And we're going to read the first 10 verses. This may not be in your notes. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And we're going to start in verse 1. This is our introduction. Uh, again, uh, if you were to ask me why I would give a thumbs up to uh, Jehoshaphat and his life, um, this is why. Okay? Uh, verse 1, 2 Chronicles chapter 17. And Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fenced cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the ways, uh, the first ways of his father David, and sought not 
unto Balaam. But sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. And so we see that there is much godliness in this man. You know, we read of some kings and, and it's just very clear and, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Or, or if we were to consider again Ahab at the beginning, uh, what a difference. Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Verse 5, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and had, he had riches and honor and abundance, and his heart was filled up in the ways of the Lord. And, moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. Now, verse 7 has, uh, verses 7 and 8 has a lot of really hard names to read. And so I'm going to skip over them because I'm a chicken. Um, but essentially, he starts to send these godly men and starts like teaching them like uh, in the city Sunday schools and things like that. Look at verse 9. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the land that were round about Judah so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. What a godly, godly king. Okay, so let's uh, continue on now. Uh, turn back. We were here just a few moments ago to chapter 18, Second Chronicles chapter 18. This is where things, I think, get a little convoluted. And unfortunately, we may be able to look and examine ourselves this morning and say, that yes, sometimes our life is a little convoluted. That uh, we love the Lord, we're Christians, and we have a good testimony, but there could be more of a separation from worldliness, a more of a separation from the, the things of the world or from Satan and his powers. So we're going to read the first three verses of Second Chronicles chapter 18. And really, this is, this is a problem, okay? Now Jehoshaphat had riches, and we saw why, had riches and honor and abundance, and joined affinity with Ahab. Now remember, I told you that I was going through the uh, life of Ahab for a reason. And this is why. I want you to consider that... This godly man, Jehoshaphat, in verse 1, puts his arm around Ahab and says, let's fight this battle together. My daughter, uh, you're, you're my uh, brother-in-law now. And uh, uh, Okay, so verse 2, and after certain years he went down to Ahab, he went down to Ahab and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go persuaded him if Jehoshaphat never would have went down he never would have been persuaded and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead and Ahab king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat king of Judah wilt thou wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead and this is I think one of the saddest verses that we're going to read this morning and he that would be Jehoshaphat answered him Ahab I am as thou art and my people as thy people and we will be with thee in war. Was Jehoshaphat a godly man? He was. But there were parts of his life that were ungodly. There's no way he should have joined affinity. And you will know that they lose this war. And Ahab does get killed at the end of this chapter. And as we've already noted, the dogs do lick Ahab's and Jezebel's 
blood. Ahab is spared, excuse me, Jehoshaphat is spared, but now turn over a chapter to chapter 19. This is after the battle, the loss of the battle. And we're going to again read the first three verses of chapter 19. And Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer, went out to see him. So this is God's prophet, this is God's message, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? Who, who is Jehu speaking about? He's speaking about Israel. He's speaking about Ahab. Why did you help the ungodly? And now I want you to catch this next verse, uh, this next phrase. It's so black and white to God. It says, and love them that hate the Lord. That was God's opinion of Jehoshaphat. At this time in your life, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, you love those that hate the Lord. When we sin, and it's a presumptuous, presumptuous sin, and we're, we're sinning because we love our flesh, because we, we love the world, we are loving them that hate the Lord. It's that black and white in God's eyes. But Satan hates that. Satan wants everything to be convoluted. He wants us to be ambivalent. Do you love the Lord? My guess, I love the Lord. And I, do you have a good testimony? Yes, in some areas, but, but could I be more like Micaiah? Am I willing? To be more like Micaiah? To be alienated from the world? Therefore, continuing on in verse 2, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Love them that hate the Lord. You love Ahab. Verse 2, the rest of verse 2, Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to sink God. If I can give you a definition of what being ambivalent is, it's Jehoshaphat. Great compromises that he made hurt God, most of all. As we close this part of of being alienated from the world. I will remind you that the world hates God. And when we side with the world, remember uh, last week's message, the week before, was that our flesh loves the world. It loves it. We must battle ourselves. We must mortify our flesh on a daily basis. So we don't love them that hate the Lord. I, I hope that this was an excellent illustration of what we are talking about when it means love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Does the world know us? Are we truly alienating ourselves from the world? Or are we ambivalent? Do we not know which course to take? Sometimes loving the world, sometimes when it's convenient for us, maybe we take a stand. It wasn't convenient for Micaiah. And he took a stand and he suffered. But he was honored so greatly in Scripture. We are the children of God. Let us act like it. Father, thank you for this time. For this opportunity again to look into your word. Father, I thank you for these three men. Ahab, such a clear picture of evil. And Micaiah, such a clear picture of good. And I also thank you, Lord, for such a clear picture 
of being on the fence. A godly man, yes, and a man that will be honored throughout history, Jehoshaphat. And yet there were times when he sided with those that hate the Lord. He loved them that hated the Lord. Let that not be said about us. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being alienated from the world. Help us to understand it and to practice it practically in our lives. We pray that your Son was honored, for we know it is only through him that we can accomplish this wonderful act. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.